Hey there, welcome to another episode of The Caption Life, a podcast about how comics and pop culture impact life and society, and vice versa. Coming to you from deep in the heart of Texas, I'm Kevin. And from Indianapolis, I'm Sean. Before we get started with this episode, please hit that subscribe button on whatever podcast platform you're listening to us on, and follow us on social media under the username at Caption Life. You can also find out more information and past episodes at thecaptionlife.com. All right, we have a very special episode today. Uh, If you have listened to this podcast before, you both you know that both Sean and I work in the field of education. I am a junior high teacher. Sean is an instructional designer at the at the collegiate level. He's higher ed. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, we actually started our friendship bonding over uh, talking about comics on Twitter and uh, kind of bonded that way. And and one of the people that I, I remember meeting around the same time uh, as you, Sean, is uh, our guest tonight. And he is he may be the the foremost expert of teaching with comics that mm-hmm. maybe has ever been. And, and if you don't know who I'm talking about, I'm glad to introduce you to him tonight. His name is Tim Smythe. He is the author of Teaching with Comics and Graphic Novels, Fun and engaging strategies to improve close reading and critical thinking in every classroom. That is a mouthful. Uh, He's also a high school social studies educator and reading specialist of 20 plus years who travels the country giving professional development to educators on the power of teaching with comics. His workshops have been given at comic book conventions, state and national education conferences, school districts, libraries, universities, and museums. Um, He's also part of a global online comics and education program through the U.S. State Department. Uh, proving that comics are truly universal. He has been published in many outlets such as PBS and also shares many resources on his website, teachingwithcomics.com. Tim also loves interacting with social media at History Comics on Twitter and the founder of two Facebook education communities, Comic Book Teachers and Teaching with Comics. Most importantly, he is the father of three children who all grew up to, sorry, (laughs) he's the father of three children who all grew to love reading through comics. Welcome to the show, Tim. Thanks, Kevin and Sean. Great to be here. Hey, it's great having you on and and to um, you know add on to what Kevin said. Actually, he and I, I believe, um, and and uh, James when he was part of the podcast, we actually came together and decided to do a podcast because of one of your tweets. So you're kind of like a godfather of this podcast <laughs> because you were pretty much the reason why we said, hey. We should start a podcast to talk about that because we're all interacting with each other on one of your tweets. So we just want to say thank you for that because we wouldn't have the show without you. <laughs> yeah, I, and it, I didn't know that. that's pretty cool. And yeah. it only took us three years to get you on here. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, Honestly, you were you were to say that, but you know, you were <laughs> like we penciled you in as guest number one. It's just things haven't lined up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's I mean, it was it was kind of crazy getting it off. And and we talked, I think, for at least two years. I said, we need to get Tim on the show. We just had so much stuff going on and everything. So, yeah. Well, Tim, welcome to the show. So uh, for those who are listening, we always start our interview with an origin story of our guests. And so we want to ask you, what is your origin story? How did you become a fan of comics and how did it lead you to where you're at today? Oh, uh, so I had to spare the sob story. I had a pretty rough childhood um, and, I, and I've I've been pretty honest with my students about uh, anxiety, social anxiety, uh, depression and um, some sexual abuse that I had as a child. And uh, my mother has uh, mental illness and all these types of things that until my 40s, I didn't realize you know what was going on. Um, and when I had a chance to be by myself, it was the comic books where I saw Bruce Wayne, where I saw the X-Men, where I saw these people going through these horrific situations. And instead of giving up, instead of being these awful human beings, they decided to make the world a better place. And so I sat in my room by myself and I just, we, we didn't have a lot of money growing up and just a few comics that I had. I mean, the ones that I still have, they're threadbare because I read through them time and time and time and time again. Um, and it really was those stories that, I mean, I don't think it's saying too much, but literally saved me uh, as a kid. And it kind of made me want to be a teacher so I could be the adult that I didn't have growing up. Um, and, my, and my dad was a cop, a Philadelphia cop. Um, and he was always like a hero to me too. And, uh, you know, he wasn't around a whole lot with shift work and all that kind of stuff. So I think when you put that all together, it was just kind of rife for that kind of superhero, but with a meaning 
kind of a thing. And I think with the X-Men being the outcast, you know, we all kind of identify with them in those different ways. And it was just amazing to see that kind of an experience. Yeah. Are you a big X-Men fan? Uh, not now. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, <laughs> not currently a fan of the whole, uh, different Island and resurrection and all that kind of stuff. But, yeah. uh, yeah, it kind of lost me a little bit. Um, but you, but certainly- you like the hits. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Growing up and everything. Yeah, absolutely. Um, even like the movies, you know, I'm excited for what might be coming in the future, but uh, I'm having a hard time kind of getting into kind of the new, the last year or two of, of X-Men. Yeah. yeah. I I got to say, I, um, oh, and I just hit my microphone. Sorry. <laughs> I got to say, I actually just read the um, powers of the House of X powers of 10 uh, trade paperback where it had it all together and i haven't read the x-men comics in the last you know 20 years and so i haven't really been up to date with any of the newer stuff and i read it and it's very fascinating but half the time i'm like i don't know what's going on because there's people that i don't know that are in this story i i don't understand like what's going on it, but it sounds like a very cool story and very complex but as somebody who hasn't been keeping up with the x-men in the comics I felt lost. I can only, I I sympathize with you in that. It seems like it's, you know, intimidating to just jump right in there when you haven't done that. Um, And then there's all these, you know, spinoffs like the, um, you know, deaths of Wolverines and lives of Wolverine and and like all these things. And I'm just like, I don't know, like who keeps up with all these comics now. So yeah, I feel you. Yeah. But, you know, and I don't want to be the old guy who, you know, kind of poo poos uh, what's going on now. Hey, whatever your thing is, it's great. Read comics, what have you. It's just that particular title is not for me right now. Right. All right. Um, Tim, how to tell us a little bit about how you got started incorporating comics into your work in the classroom. Uh, that's funny. So I've been in 20 plus years now. So like I was brought in like, don't let the kids see you smile till Christmas. Like, you know, all that kind of stuff. Don't mm-hmm. share anything about yourself. Don't share personal things. And uh, so I was kind of by the book, always a hard nosed teacher. I've taught AP courses, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. And when Miles Morales came out, so I, I always loved comics, obviously, but I loved comics and hip hop growing up. And those two things actually go very well together. Um, I love that, like, Daryl McDaniels is making his own comics now. And, you know, it just blows my mind. But like, I didn't talk about comics when I was in high school in Philly because I would have gotten my my ass beat. Like, you know, it just you didn't talk about that stuff back then. And so I talked about hip hop in my classroom and we, we listened to music and stuff. But it was when Miles Morales came out and I had this one uh, African-American boy, probably 17 years old, quiet kid that I didn't really connect with. You know, we try to reach kids in different ways and he and I just never really. And uh, I don't know. I just said, hey, you know, this is pretty cool. Like, you know, this new Spider-Man came out and. He came up to me after class and it, it like it was just like he was more impressed that Spider-Man looked like him than mm-hmm. our president did. Right. Like, yeah. All right. Fine. You know, we have a biracial president. Big deal. But Spider-Man. <laughs> so I was like, oh, OK, like we can talk about this. And it really just kind of flipped the switch in my head as a history teacher that, you know, pop culture is history. And what we're seeing in the world around us is reflected in our TV shows and our music and absolutely in our comic books. And uh, honestly, once once that hit, um, I just never looked back. And so um, it, it was like these little things that I did. And then why where it went from there was like I had this staff developer who told me, like, you know, you, you need a blog and you need a Twitter. And I had no idea what these things were. And I was like, I was like, that's like what the millennials do. Right. And that's like that's bragging. And that's not what teachers do. And like, God bless uh, AJ Giuliani. Like he, he got me to do these things and uh, a publisher or an editor from PBS uh, reached out to me and she's like, Hey, uh, do, do you want to write a, an article for PBS? Uh, yeah. And so I, in my first article I wrote for PBS and it was about Miles Morales and, and Miss Marvel and, and faith and all these different characters. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm getting in contact with these educators from around the world. And I was like, holy crap, like this is a thing. And then, yeah, it's just been a whirlwind. It's been like six years of just, oof, I wish I would have done this earlier in my career. Yeah, definitely. Well, and, and I think I remember reading something about, and, and you can tell me if this is something that you want to share or don't share anything, but I think you were at a point where 
you're kind of questioning if you wanted to continue teaching. And then I think you talked to your principal about this and you told them that, you know, you really love comics and they really encourage you to pursue like how to incorporate that into your classroom as well too. Is that right? Kind of. Um, okay. <laughs> I, 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 just, I remember reading that and I thought it was really fascinating. Yeah. So it was, so I've been teaching for a while, uh, you know, like 14 years or so and love mm-hmm. teaching, still do. And I, I finally had like that year that you always heard about. Um, and I, I really was on the way out the door. I had resigned as department chair. I mean, it was just, and it wasn't the kids. It was all the other stuff that goes on. And I literally was just questioning, like, I, I don't know that I can do this job anymore. Mm-hmm. And, you know, talking to my wife, who's also a teacher and, you know, we need the paycheck. We have children, you know, what else are you going to do? And then it was that affirmation, that idea that, you know, what we do in our classrooms really resonates around the world. And I suddenly started enjoying teaching in a way that I hadn't for a very long time. And it's because I allowed myself now that I reached that low point of what does it matter? I'm going to do what I like to do. Mm -hmm. And turns out the kids liked it too. (laughs) And I think it's, I think it's great that a lot of, um, a lot of what you're talking about and a lot of the, a lot of uh, let's say the the there's a lot of important aspects to representation and and getting books into kids' hands with characters that that look like them. And I think that the way that um, the way that comics has reflected our changing society uh, is it's a powerful tool because the people who want to ignore that, or I kind of feel like they're trying to bury their heads in the sand and ignore that the world is changing around them. Let's, let's not make characters uh, that have been traditionally of color be characters of color. Let's, let's not include, um, you know, LGBT characters. Um, You know, so there's, there's this notion that, that if we ignore it, that the problem would go away, but comics seems to be at the forefront of, of, um, almost like educating, help, helping people to understand our differences. Yeah. that Well said. Um, I mean, my kids growing up, my three kids, I mean, you know, one of their favorite heroes, mine too, is a 16 year old Pakistani American girl from Jersey city, like Miss Marvel. <laughs> um, it's just normal for them. And so, you know, for them to hear about a gay character, they're like, yeah, all right. So what? Like it's, it doesn't even mean it. Like, I don't mean it doesn't mean anything, but it's not a shock anymore. But I remember like hugely bringing in the debates into my classroom when um, Captain America, when Falcon becomes Captain America and people, you know, some people were really freaking out about, well, you know, that's not America. And so we had this whole conversation about, you know, what is an American and what are our symbols and what does that represent and, and all these things. And, you know, you're ruining my childhood on the other side of things. And but yet there's there's black folk who didn't like that either. And so we talk about that, too. It wasn't like it was just white America that was against this. It's also the idea of why can't we create new and meaningful black characters and Native American characters rather than change. So we're not all on the same page and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, But it opens the door to those conversations in a way that I can't do with a textbook or, you know, a reading or a lecture in a traditional way. Yeah. Well, and I think it's really fascinating. I think it's really um, great because I, I'm somebody, I'm not in the classroom like I used to be. I, I used to be a teacher and, and I'm not in the class anymore, but I just love the idea of being able to use comics because it's a really cool tool to be able to have some of those conversations that can be a little bit more engaging and interesting for students. That's still very timely. I think there's that preconceived notion that's out there that, you know, comics is still for kids and things like that. And, um, you know, there's a lot of, comics and graphic novels that have a wide range of topics that they touch on that's very you know thought provoking and timely and appropriate for what's going on in the world but there's also you know graphic novels that are less superhero genre and more educational like march um that i know you had talked about on twitter lately um that's a great one to talk about with civil rights and everything and so yeah <laughs> that book right there yeah <laughs> um so yeah so i so i think it's really cool and w- what i want to ask you here is you know you gave a couple examples of how you've used comics in your teaching um do you have like a common strategies that you usually use when you're thinking about comic books uh, for teaching or is there like a specific 
specific book that you that's a go to for you that you always use um, in your classroom for comics or anything like that? And, and that's a question I'm always asking at presentations and things like, well, how do you get these, you know, class sets of these comics and things? And, you know, I, I go to the comic book store every Wednesday. Um, and a lot of times it's just using a panel and, you know, putting it up on a smart board. You know, we get um, Batman gets into police profiling. We get Captain America who talks about uh, immigration and that debate. And sometimes you're just putting up that panel and saying, all right, you guys have 10 minutes to discuss what's going on and find a news article that goes along with why this comic was created kind of thing. So there's that that aspect of it. It costs you three ninety nine. dollars um, My first lesson I do in the year is, you know, I go to the dollar bins and, and flea markets and all that kind of stuff. And I buy comics that are all beat up from different uh, decades. And so I've got comics from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and I put them out around the classroom and I have the kids analyze comics as historical artifacts. And so they go through and they take a look at the advertisements, they take a look at gender roles, they take a look at, you know, all those kinds of things. And it opens that conversation to what is history? And the answer is always yes. Social Mm -hmm. studies is literally every single thing that you can think about. That is what is an artifact in our classroom. And it just blows their mind that it's not just a textbook and it's not just George Washington's letters. And, you know, Frankenstein itself is pop culture, like, you know, all those things that we can, we can kind of talk about. So there's that aspect. Um, and, and if I can, on, on my website, the, uh, the one that always is the most popular page is I, I have a free comics uh, part of my website that's parked. It just says free comics. And there's all kinds of great materials that are out there too, full comics that have mm-hmm. been produced that are free and, you know, copyright legal to use in your classroom, download, whatever you want to do with that. So there's that too. Um, but the book that I use every year is, is the March trilogy. I am blessed to have a district that believes in this. And so they bought me class sets of all three books. So all of our 11th grade students read all three books. Um, we also read uh, Kyle Baker's Nat Turner, Confessions of Nat Turner, because it's a wordless comic. And so it really gets us into close reading skills Kids make easy connections to the Jewish Holocaust and, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, we use Superman Red Sun to talk about the Cold War, right? So Superman crash lands in Soviet Russia. Uh, next week to talk about protest songs. I'm using this uh, comics adaptation of some Bob Dylan songs. And so the artists reinterpret his lyrics in their own way. And then I have my kids design their own based on lyrics that were listened to from 60s protest songs and stuff like that. So but I like to change it up all the time. Like there's, um, I use a Star Wars comic because the Star Wars, um, I forget who they're called, but the Stormtroopers are like the good guys in the comic from, it's a comic from Jason Aaron. And so I bought a class set. I bought 30 comics of that to kind of flip around point of view. Um, there is a Champions comic from Jim Zub where there's a school shooting at Spider-Man's at Miles Morales' high school. And I was like, yep. In fact, my comic book store, when I walked in, they're like, here, you're probably going to want 30 <laughs> Um, so sometimes I do do that. And that was a powerful conversation when the kids said, yeah, it's, it's in our comics now. Um, and so, you know, those sorts of things I use, um, the black issue for amazing Spider-Man about nine 11. Um, you know, so, so I don't, I don't have any, like probably my, my one go-to, um, that I always certainly do are those two. It's Nat Turner and the March trilogy. So here you talk about all this, um, I know you had said, you know, one example what you've done is put a panel up as kind of a, I don't know, you know, bell ringer work or something like that. Yeah. But it also sounds like they read like the entire comic book in some instances as well, too. Is, is that correct? And if so, do they read that in addition to the textbook or do you substitute that or, or how do you usually structure that? So it, it all depends, right? Like yeah. um, I, I still believe in, in showing students how to use a textbook. I know some of us are like, Textbooks bad. Never use a textbook. I, I think we need to, you know, incorporate all different types of text, um, podcasts, and you know, audiobooks and comic books and textbooks and primary source materials and and all that stuff. So sometimes with the comics, it might be here. It is up on the smart board, and then you know, I only have one copy of the of the comic, and I'll always have a kid co- uh, kind of comes up and wants to borrow the comic and read the comic. Um, and we also started a pop culture club in my in my, in my school, so I, I run that too. And, uh, you know, so that's, and we also have an enrichment period, two days out of a six day cycle. And I literally, my room is full of comic books and that's what the kids do. They choose to spend 50 minutes. They come into my room, 
and they read comics. There's no grades. There's just, we talk about it. We have these passionate, they always pull me in like, well, who's going to win in the battle between Hulk and, you know, and they take it very personal and, you know, <laughs> but the, the evidence that they're using and the passion that they have, and, you know, it, it's just, it's fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> that sounds like, that sounds like the, the most fun class to have. Um, and I, you know what, I have a, I started a, a, I call it FACE. It's the Federation of Anime and Comics Enthusiasts uh, at, my, at my campus. And I did it because I wanted to share my love of comics with kids. And um, I've told this story before. My first meeting, I realized I had a lot more anime fans than like comic book fans. And so I had to learn like on the fly, like real quick uh, about a lot of the stuff that they were into. But like, it's just, a, it's just another way that kids teach us. Um, like, you know, I go to work every day and I learned something. Um, I learned something from kids. I, I learned how to, I learned how to do a lightsaber effect in Photoshop today from a 13 year old or 14 year old. So like it's uh, every single day. Um, do you think, do you think of, like specifically about your job? Because you teach at the, you teach at the high school level, correct? Yeah. Do you think, do you think it's the, the age group, the audience that you have? that makes um that makes comics so uh powerful or makes them such an important tool or do you think it's our our time and place um where we're at in in society now what, what do you what do you think makes comics um like click with kids in the 21st century classroom uh, honestly i think um because i do a lot of work with elementary and uh middle school and i do also uh university work too High school students, so I teach mostly 10th and 11th graders now, um, some of them are too cool to read comic books. Some of them um, have never read a comic book before. And so they really are resistant, uh, some, to, to this idea, or they see it as a novelty and they don't really see it. So I really, every year, it's, it's, it's exhausting sometimes where you got to start all over again in the beginning of the year um, of getting into that argument again. I mean, you've got some kids, they're already in, they they know about my class. They can't. They're so excited. They have me and they know what's going on. Um, but, you know, I, I had a student who really fought me like on on the March graphic novel and um, just hated it. And her dad came in. He was all mad. And, you know, this comic book classroom. And I said, here, I said, read the book. And then he came back to me the next week. He's like, I, I don't know what her problem is. Like, this is the <laughs> this is the best thing I've ever read. And so the point is, like, it's not for everybody and that's okay. Um, annotating music is not for everybody and that's okay. It's just another piece of it. But that being said, I think the United States is finally starting to catch up with the rest of the world in terms of comics as literature. Um, it's been a bit of an uphill battle, but I think particularly because of anime and also because of the explosion of the Marvel movies that all of a sudden now we have this common um, folklore to pull on and so when i'm talking about these characters it's not just the white nerdy kid it's the it's the girls who own the comic book store in philly uh, in amalgam uh black female uh store owner it's it's the characters it's the creators it's it, they're just everywhere now but um i do think it's the power of those movies that have have allowed the comics to kind of make their way into more of the mainstream and I also think that it's the old farts like us, I'm sorry, like me, I, I won't put you guys in that, who <laughs> our kids now have the same interest. And mm -hmm. now all of a sudden it's this intergenerational type of a thing. And in my work with the State Department, like I'm working in, we've, we've done work on every single continent except for Antarctica. And everybody knows these characters. And I'm always learning about new characters from other cultures as well. But everybody knows who most of these, you know, American comic book heroes are. And when we see, like, what I teach my students about the Arab Spring, and we see in Egypt the protesters out, and these kids are wearing, facing down tanks, and they're wearing Superman shirts. And I'm like, that means something. And so I think with the advent of the, of the movies and, well, um, PHL or, or the Warner Brothers networks have done a fantastic job with the TV shows. Um, and I just think with social media, like all this stuff, it just, it just kind of hit. And on top of all that, the comics are more relevant because of that representation. Right. I, I can't wait. Um, my favorite comic is, is champions. And I just can't wait 
until there's a movie when we're seeing, you know, Miles Morales and Kamala Khan and, and uh, Braun, who's the Korean Hulk, if you will now, and like all these and Viv and, you know, all these kinds of new young characters, I think are going to all of a sudden send in this shockwave of reinvigoration with the younger people with the comics. And I know my grandkids will be reading about the same heroes. And it's just, I mean, not to get off topic, but like, you know, my son and I watching the Obi-Wan trailer last night, like chills, right? Like, and I watched that stuff with my dad when I was a kid. So now it's just, it's everywhere. You, yeah. you can't get away with it. Even if, even if you wanted to. I think you, I think you, what you said about your grandkids, like reading these characters or loving these characters, like I, that's the, what, the legacy of all of it is is what resonates for me because I kind of feel like we're living in like mo- through modern mythology. Okay, like if you if we if we scroll ahead a thousand years, people will be people will be talking about Superman and the Incredible Hulk like they were Hercules and Zeus um, from 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 Greek mythology, um, and people will be like people the young kids will ask, well, was Superman real? <laughs> you know, was was the Incredible Hulk? Was that a real person? Because we, you know, if you look back, like the way that the history has melded the stories together, even with things like um, the the Trojan War, things like that. Like you look at the way that the stories are told and the line between, um, you know, reality and, and fiction is is blurred. I, I feel like that our kids are so lucky that they get to come up in this time where like it's not just ancient tales of these characters. Like we, we have new stories for these these things that we love coming out all the time. And um, I think you're right. I think the 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 popularity of the the especially the MCU has blown the door open. And I I I know that it's gonna it's gonna be hard for them to keep generating like that high quality content like over and over and over again. But they they keep the excitement building. And and when when you have like me and Sean talk about this all the time about this lull that we're in right now where there's no MCU content. Um that 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 they'll turn to the comic books and they'll pick up a book and they'll read. So mm-hmm. I I think that's that's great. Yeah, and that and that's a cool thing when you're like, did you like the movie? Read the book. <laughs> but the book in this case is is a comic book. Absolutely. Oh yeah, you know it, it's funny because um, growing up, I you know was into all the superheroes, the Superman and Batman and the X Men and things like that. And my parents never were. And I've said this on the show the person that actually got me into comics is my uncle and i didn't really have a lcs growing up and so my uncle was my lcs you know so to speak because he, he had was all your the dealer comics. he yeah. was yeah he was he first was my, one's free kid exactly yeah <laughs> uh, but what's what's funny is um you know speaking of the mcu like i think it's just the stories that's really captivating because the batman that just came out has been uh, you know, everyone's been talking about it to the point where my mom texted me and she's like, I would like to go see the Batman. Would you, you know, go see it with me? I was like, yeah, sure. Let's do it. You know? And so it's just funny that growing up, she would take, she and my dad would take me to go see it because I wanted to. And then now it kind of flipped where she wants to go see it because she's heard, you know, great, such great things about it. And I think it just tells you the power of comics in terms of a storytelling medium that it kind of transcends the comics now into all these different kinds of mediums. Cause we don't have just the movies. Now we have audio dramas, right? Like Marvel has all this wastelander audio dramas that are high quality, high, highly produced with um, very popular um, actors in there. Like the, the current one I'm listening to right now is black widow. Um, that's being voiced by uh, Susan Sarandon and, you know, they're exploring that they have all these uh, books that are coming out that aren't, you know, comics, but they're uh, books that people can read as novels. And so it just kind of transcends that medium because the story is what's really captivating and compelling and not necessarily the medium that's in it as well, too. Yeah, yeah and, that's, that's a good and, point. And you get invested in those characters mm-hmm. like um I remember thinking I, I remember seeing it in passing like there were some young young uh, readers at some point where I saw in a bookstore where they were the, like the backstory of Captain Jack Sparrow. And I was like, man, I would love to read. I would love to read that because yeah. like I like Captain Jack Sparrow as a character. And, and you know, who knows how long you'd have to wait to, to find one another of his adventures. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you get that. Like one of my favorite shows, um, Firefly 
yeah it does it only existed for a short time but in the comics it it kind of went on for for much longer so like there's there's just so many so many gateways comics mm-hmm. are a gateway to literacy <laughs> gateway <laughs> drug to literacy art spiegelman yeah 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 <laughs> exactly but now, but now sean brings up a good point i didn't think of that my kids have all kinds of prose books about uh shuri and and different characters and you know it's not just about the comics too it, it, you're absolutely right it transcends to a lot of different versions of the text and everything else too yeah oh yeah definitely well even um i, I left this out but like video games spider-man yeah. and spider-man miles morales is one of my favorite video games not because of not just because of the gameplay but the story it's just so good and mm-hmm. i love how they incorporated a lot of really neat things to inspire younger generations like the spider-man video game with peter parker um as the protagonist uh has a couple of scenes where you do some engineering stuff some science and technology stuff and so it incorporates some of the stem stuff that gets people excited but what i really love about that game is you get to explore a world over at feast which is the homeless shelter that aunt may uh runs and you get to hear these stories of people who are homeless that are really, really good stories in terms of what you really hear from people who have been homeless or currently homeless. And you get to see that it's not a simple problem that is fixable or anything like that. Or it's not one of those things where, you know, they're homeless because they choose to be or because they didn't work hard enough or anything like that. And so it tells a really cool story in a lot of different ways. And so, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I can go on and on about that. No, that's what we have to sneak. We have to sneak the education stuff into the video games. we got to meet them where they're at. <laughs> right. But I think, um, you know, someone was uh, telling us that, um, you know, some people figured out how to navigate New York City because of that game, because uh-huh. it was really, you know, accurate. And they made sure that it's, something that you could recognize if you go through. And so I thought it was really fascinating that they could actually navigate mm-hmm. through New York city just because they played a video game. And so all the details that go into that, but the experience that draws you in just goes way beyond ju- the gameplay, you know? Yeah. So yeah. And, and it's because of those stories. That was a, I think we talked about that with Madden because there was somebody else had given an example of like a tour guide getting lost in Rome and yeah. a kid knew a kid knew where to go because of the um Assassin's Creed yeah video game Assassin's Creed is great yeah <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean when you can run around the estates general during the French Revolution like boom like yeah ah. oh I know yeah it's fantastic but like my my son like we talk about like you know when we're teachers and you have to prepare the kids for the jobs that we don't even know that exist yet that's mm-hmm. what he, that's what he wants to do. He wants to write stories for video games. I'm like, yeah, please, please. like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, well, and 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 that's the cool thing about it is that these kinds of um, jobs and art are going to be plentiful in the future because I mean, again, look at the game, the video game industry is it's not linear like how we are or how like how we grew up with video games like super Mario brothers, where you literally Mario, you know, stayed in one place and the rest of the game moved right now. There's very intricate stories that gets played into the video game. And, and there's just going to be a lot more opportunities to be able to be able to be storytellers that goes beyond the traditional writing a book or writing a script play or, um, or a comic or a theater or things like that. And so I think that's going to be a really big boom is because everyone's seen that stories are really at the crux of learning and connection and moving people more than anything else. So, um, Tim changing gears a little bit, you do have a book that's coming out that we want to talk about called teaching with comics and graphic novels from Routledge publishing. And we want to just know from you, uh, you know, what is this book about? What made you decide to write this book? Um, I don't know how this is going to sound, but the reason I decided to write it was not only because I wanted to, but the amount of people who, who kept asking me like, well, when's your book coming out? Um, (laughs) And it was kind of like, all right, so I might get a few people who might actually want to buy this thing. Um, But it was because like, I'm not a very smart person, you know, like I'm not a naturally smart person. I read a lot and it's where my knowledge comes from. And, and, you know, you read a lot of these books and you get a lot of edgy speak and things thrown at you. And, you know, the chapters that you just kind of skip through my book is just like, here's some things to get you started, right? Here's some ways you could use it in science and, and math and these sorts of things. Um, and it's some basic lesson plan ideas. 
and you don't get lost in all the like. And so it's it's like whenever we go to a presentation, whenever we have an in-service, the best ones are always like, all right, I got something I can use in my class tomorrow. And that's that's what I want from this. So they were kind enough to make it a, a larger book so you can actually photocopy pages from it. Um, and I've had original art in there, like my first comic that I wrote and hired artists for. Um, Ryan Dunlavy, who does action presidents, he's amazing. He, he did some of the art. So I got to write my first scripts for a comic and you know, all those sorts of things. So that stuff in there. Uh, my own three kids produced art for there. My my students' work is in there. Um, so it's just kind of one of those things where, and yeah, I put in some like common core stuff, and I, I did put some of that in there too, but it's just basically nuts and bolts. And, and I just wanted to share my my excitement and my passion. And I just got tired of I, I lost some like in-service opportunities with some districts. We're like, oh, that's great. We, you know, we want to hire you and bring you out. And, and they're like, all right, so what's the name of your book? And I'm like, I, 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 don't, I don't have one. And it's almost like you can hear the click. Like there still is that weight. If, despite the fact that I'm published from PBS, despite the fact that I write for Macmillan and Scholastic and I work for the State Department, I do all this. And I work with the Pennsylvania Department of Education. I do all these things. The fact that I didn't have a book, um, and so that kind of helps with that too. And, and just to kind of put that out there um, for people that they can have that and they can show that. And I think it helps push that argument forward when an educator can not only say, hey, this is why I think it's such a great idea, but here's this published book. Um, and here's some simple and easy ways that an administrator can take a look at that or a parent can take a look at that and say, all right, yeah, you know, I see where you're going with that. And then when you're done with the book, it doesn't end there go to the Facebook pages that we have and the social media and the podcasts and all that stuff. And because when I first started down this journey, like 2007, um, I was going back to college to be a reading specialist. And I started doing this whole thing with the comics. It, it was, it was really lonely back then. And I think now there's so many more folks on board with this. Um, like I wish this book would have been there for me all the way back then. And so I'm hoping now that it can be. And in fact, it's really cool. Um, University of Pennsylvania hired my wife and I to teach professional development courses using that book starting this summer. So comics are now going Ivy League with me, which <laughs> like just pinched me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a good thing that the book is coming out this summer um, because I'll, I'm, I'm in the classroom every day. And I can tell you that teaching has never been more difficult and we're going to need all the resources we can get going forward. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Uh, you know, I, I think, I think a lot of people who are teachers got into education because um, somebody inspired them. And I can see that, uh, that you, you, what you're doing is in, is inspiring to people. It's giving a people giving people a way to connect with like the Facebook group. Um, also sharing resources and saying like, hey, you know, this is what I've done. Let me let me give you something to help you know um, help carry the burden that you that you have. Um, it's one of the it's one of the many reasons why uh, we we say that teachers are superheroes and we don't say it flippantly, um, but. Because teachers are superheroes, I wanted to do a little round robin game with you guys uh, and play a little thing called Superhero High School, where um, we I'm going to ask you some questions and you're going to tell me about um, a, a teacher. You tell me about a superhero that you would like to see um, teaching a class. OK, so like I'm going to give you nice. I'm going to give you, um, let's say, chemistry. Mm -hmm. And you would tell me, like, what superhero do you think would do a great job teaching your chemistry class? We'll just throw that out there. So that's the first <laughs> one. I'm, I'm trying to think of, and I saw the panel, it is a Spider-Man comic book, and the bad guy is like a pterodactyl. And I'm trying to think of the one that it is. And he says something like, you have all this knowledge and all this whatever, why don't you try to save it to the world? And the kind of the message is like, yeah, but I can be this. And I'm, It's not my answer, but I'm, I'm trying to think of the, the, the panel. Oh, but it, it was just so funny. It's like the things that we do with the technology that we have, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've mentioned Spider-Man villains on this podcast before, how they're all like misguided because they are using the the things that they create the technology they have like for crime whereas in reality if they if they had these powers and and use them for like profiteer like actual 
like work they could make <laughs> tons of 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 money like the shocker and his shock waves like could could make a killing in oil and gas right. um <laughs> I, I always like like victor freeze like it's such a it's a sad sad story that he's just trying to save his wife and so you have so there you go that i guess that would be my answer because it's just it's not something you would expect like the arnold schwarzenegger like version of you know Right, um, yeah <laughs> right but it goes a lot deeper than that and and isn't that what we want i mean you can get into the monkey's paw and you can get into poe and you can get into all that that literature idea that here's a man using science that could very well benefit us all mm-hmm. um and at the core of all this is the love for his wife yeah that that's my answer i like that one. <laughs> i like mr freeze as a teacher mostly because um i live in texas and you'd n- you'd never have to worry if his classroom was going to be like hot, right? Like his classroom is going to be the coldest in the building. <laughs> there you go. Ice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what about uh, uh, what about um, your P- the PE? Who would teach PE at your at your high school? It's got to be. It's got to be either. I, w- I would say. Batman or Captain America, one of those two, probably more Batman. And the reason why I would say Batman is because to have someone teach you PE, you got to have somebody that doesn't already have a natural super strength, right? Okay. Because then the kids will always be like, well, yeah, of course you can do that because you're <laughs> Superman or you're Captain America. But if you have someone like Batman that's built because he keeps himself into peak space or I can't believe I didn't think about this before, but Bane without the venom would be great. <laughs> um, I think it would be a little bit more attainable because then it gives students something to really go for and, and feel like oh, if, if this person who has no superpowers can do this, then I can as well too. So I don't know. I, I you said Captain America and I, I just picture Steve Rogers in like a white polo shirt, blue um, coaches shorts and like socks pulled up to his calf. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I would just imagine him being in his Captain America suit the whole time. <laughs> yeah. He'd be climbing that rope. He'd be like you said, like of course you can climb the rope. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Captain Super Coach America. Serum. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the way things are, there's some days maybe you want Frank Castle to be in there um, <laughs> getting the kids to toe the line too, right? <laughs> yeah, without, the guns, without the guns. <laughs> he's he would be he would be the best like lunchroom monitor. Like nobody would, nobody oh would my get God. out of line. Oh, he'd be a great um, uh, cafeteria like cook, <laughs> right? <laughs> lunch, lunch lady, Punisher, right? Yeah. <laughs> Eat your <Okay>. protein. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What? No, it doesn't matter the class. What mm-hmm. superhero would you want to take a class from? I, I have to go with Charles Xavier. I, I, I do. I think just with the all around intelligence, the, 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 the wiseness, the, well, I mean, the ability to connect to anything in the world, I think that, would, and for me growing up for those reasons, I saw him as a, you know, calming, accepting parental figure. I think he would be a nice social, emotional learning, right? Isn't that the buzzword right now? He mm-hmm. would be like the SEL King. Um, so not only would mm-hmm. you want to learn from him, but you really could learn a lot from him. You know, what's funny is he was actually the first person that popped in my head too. But then I was immediately like, but I don't know if I want to go in and with all the snarky stuff I say in my head all the time mm-hmm. with the class, when I'm in classroom with like what people say, what teachers say and all that, like, I, I'm like, I, I don't know if I want to read my mind and, and knowing all the snarky things I'm thinking all the time. Cause I never say them, but I'm thinking them all the time. Um, but I think so superhero, um, I think what would be really cool to take a class from would be um, Wolverine because I think it'd be really cool to hear the stories that he has to tell in terms of like first hand accounts. And it, it, I like it, it would have to be a history course, right? Because I can't see him being a teacher and like other kinds of things other than mm-hmm. like maybe, maybe PE or woodshop, woodshop. <laughs> woodshop. <Yeah. laughs> exactly. But I, I think it would be really cool to see 
Wolverine as a teacher, even though it might not be in his, um, it, it, cause he's always an anti-hero. It may not be in his nature to be a teacher in the traditional sense, but he always kind of lands in that role. Like Kevin, you and I talked about this on the show, how mm -hmm. he is always seen as like a non, a team player, but he's the character that's on the most teams of any mm -hmm. comics, uh, character, uh, of all of them, you know? So I think it'd be really cool to just take a course from him. Um, yeah, I, I will, I will stay on the X-Men bandwagon and say it's, it's been my lifelong, um, like, desire to be taught by hank mccoy like the the, yeah, the yeah. version of the beast from um like the version of the beast from the animated series just made being smart seem so cool mm -hmm. um and like he was he was smart at everything like he was always reading books he like knew technology he knew like chemistry and everything i just think that uh he would be he would be cool he kind of seems like the the kind of teacher that i am too where like like he's he is very intelligent he is cool he connects with the kids but mm -hmm. like you don't want to make him angry because there's there is a, a beast in there somewhere <laughs> um I, I feel like i have to toe that line sometimes uh but i i do love the beast um okay so you're a, this is the this is the i got two more for you you're a principal and blank shows up as a substitute teacher for your campus who do you not want to see show up as a substitute teacher on your campus? Uh, anybody from the wrecking crew? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Deadpool. Deadpool, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> Deadpool yeah. would be the most popular substitute teacher right. in the history of substitute yeah, teaching. Right. He, he would be, be the to... one that's like starting the riots and like, let's do a walkout from this school you know, <laughs> yeah. first 20 minutes. <laughs> He'd never be able to work more than one day <laughs> right? on any campus. He would... <laughs> Could you just imagine like a television show where he goes from campus to campus as a substitute teacher, like, <laughs> like Kung Fu just walks the play, walks the face of the earth. Right. Substitute <laughs> teaching. Uh, okay. Last question. You're in, you're in high school and which superhero is your is your best friend? Who do you who do you hang out with in the hallways? He didn't exist then, but I, I would say Miles Morales just because of the dope soundtrack that just surrounds him, the mm -hmm. Jordans that he has that I couldn't afford as a kid um, that I always wanted, um, and he's just so down to earth, um, and his friends with spider Gwen and yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I would think probably miles Morales. Yep. Uh, for me, I, again, this character wasn't around or at least it wasn't a character I was aware of when I was growing up, but I would think, um, either Captain Marvel or Kate Bishop, because they seem like a lot of fun to hang out with in high school. Um, just because they, you know, Captain Marvel has her powers, but she's also somebody that, um, is really relatable and you know when when uh you read her read her in the comics she has a lot of really close relationships with a lot of different people um and even has like this really quirky kind of fun relationship with spider-man where um i forget which run it was but spider-man was thinking about like asking her out on a date and everything it didn't really work out that way but they still like remain friends after that fact so i feel like even though Captain Marvel and Kate Bishop are these kick-ass superheroes. There's also people that you can really hang out with and not feel intimidated by them because they really treat you as, you know, somebody that would, that they would see, you know, as their equal in the sense that they're not really better than you or anything like that. And I really love that about their personalities. Yeah. I, I was thinking about saying something cool, like, like Hawkeye, like somebody that like could do cool, like, you know, like flip that quarter mm -hmm. and like, like turn the projector off something like, you know, <laughs> hijinks, but I know who I am on the inside. And I know that like, had she been at my high school, I would have been firmly entrenched in the friend zone with one, uh, rogue. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> I would have, have carried her. I would have carried her books to every single class. <laughs> And be like, do you need anything? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I'm not proud of it, okay? But <laughs> hey, we to each their own, right? I mean, I think everybody have... has some sort of comic book crush on somebody. <laughs> <laughs> well, specifically because 
the the reason why I said the friend zone was because like you know she can't she can't touch anybody right um so it, like it doubles down the fact that like she would have never chose me as like a potential like boyfriend anyway but then like the, also like the you know the the weird creepy like appreciating from afar <laughs> like yeah the, like, the I, like i said i'm like not... high five that you can't really touch yeah or like, like oh, waving friend, at frenzies six senses yeah, yeah. six senses away <laughs> so sad yeah so you were like preparing for covid before we even knew <laughs> right yeah that's the ideal covid girlfriend yeah right she i've seen t-shirts where she's like flexing it says uh social distancing champ <laughs> <laughs> so i'm gonna have to find that and get that for your birthday now kevin uh, I mean, I didn't tell you about this the other day. Madden tried to give me to give him money so that he could buy Rogue and Gambit in Fortnite. In Fortnite, <laughs> and he's like, "You could, you can come play with with us. Like, you can be Rogue. Like, look." And I was like, "As tempting as that is, man, you're gonna yeah. have to earn your own money." There you go. That's how they get you, man. Like when I first got in Fortnite, I remember thinking, "Why would I get any skins if it doesn't give you like any powers or anything like that?" But then they just come out with like really cool characters. I'm like. All right, I got to get it. <laughs> now I have both of the Hawkeyes. I have Daredevil. I have Batman from the 0. 0.4 Fortnite comic book run, both the armored Batman and the Fortnite 0. 0.0 Batman skin. And and uh, yeah, that's just how they get you. And, and I have the Spider-Man one because I decided to do the battle pass. And and if you do the battle pass, sorry, I'm, I'm nerding out about Fortnite right now. But if you do battle pass, you get a bunch of skins and stuff like that um so yeah I, or, and, and i thought about you when i saw rogue and gambit i was like i gotta tell kevin <laughs> yeah no he came and got me he's like yeah i want to show you something <laughs> um fortnite's fortnite's also like a drug it's it's free to start <laughs> yeah that, yep that's how they get you <laughs> oh man so many so many good places to go when you get started on 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 tangents but I, I think that uh, I think that going to a, a superhero school would have been great. I'll tell you before we go, the one person that I would be ultra cautious of if they worked on my campus is Mystique. Yeah. <laughs> like she'd be the ultimate assistant principal. Like you never know who you're talking to. Like, hey guys, where's the party at tonight? And then she turns <laughs> into assistant principal Mystique, and you're like, oh, we're busted. Well, Although she'd be thinking- show. Go ahead, Tim. <laughs> I was gonna say I think that actually the ultimate history teacher I was thinking would be would be the watcher. Like how cool would that be? Oh, oh yeah, awesome. right. Except he would be he would be more of that college professor that would tell you all the stories and then you just get overwhelmed and you're just like, he is way too smart to be teaching anybody. <laughs> well, he'd be like, you'd be like, Well, can I have the study guide and what's on the test? And he wouldn't be able to interfere, right? So that's yeah. like, <laughs> 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 That's a great one. <laughs> we'll have to we we have to maybe think about this as a as a future podcast episode, like go through some some more of these, yeah, uh, and and send it out to uh, some people on- online, get some feedback. But hey, uh, Tim, before we let you go, we want to say thank you for coming on the show. Uh, before we sign off tonight, can you can you tell everybody where they can find you online, where they can find your work? Yeah, so uh, my website is teachingwithcomics.com um, and my social media is at History Comics for Instagram and Twitter. And much to my daughter's chagrin, I started an experiment with TikTok a little bit, uh, but there's not much on there. But you can find me at Teaching With Comics on TikTok. Well, awesome. we're following you there on TikTok too. Yeah, she's, she's, uh, she's my 10th grader. So I teach 10th graders and I come home to a 10th grader, but uh, she's going to start... Uh, let me know how to how to use it in the right way. <laughs> you got you got to get somebody the young people to help you with the social media. Yep, yep. this is true. But hey, listen, I I've been on a lot of different interviews and stuff, and you, we've interacted on on Twitter and whatnot. It's the first time I'm really getting a chance to meet you guys. But I feel like I've known you guys for like forever. Um, I feel like we're just hanging out in a restaurant and having a conversation. This right. is awesome. Oh, same here. We yeah, we enjoy do this, and that's what we try to do is is make it like a fun friendly conversation and. And I got to say, I'm very excited that we finally get to talk virtually, you know, in, in this sense, because I feel like we all have like great personalities and and uh, that's really shine through here. So I really I appreciate that. And I can say the same. And and you really were there in our minds at at the inception of all of this. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's an honor to have you on. Finally, I appreciate that. Thank you. 
Uh, that is going to wrap up another episode of The Caption Life. We hope you enjoyed listening. And that wraps up another episode of The Caption Life. We hope you enjoyed listening. Don't forget to smash that subscribe button on whatever major podcast platform you listen to. And you can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Caption Life. If you like what we're doing, give us a shout out. Tag us in a post. For more info about us and all of our previous episodes, please visit thecaptionlife.com. Until next time, adios. See ya.